you, worship team. I'm sitting over there taking pictures of slides from the music. And I was sitting down with my brother this last week and stopped and saw him on the way home and when we got to the menu, the board, I, I put on my glasses and, and I took them off. We sat out at the table and, and I put on my glasses. He said, what are you putting on your glasses for? I said, so I can see your eyes. He said, so you've gotten old enough to need them all the time. And I, uh, I want to read. <laughs> so, all right. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battle. The more I thought about this week, the more I thought about Jesus meeting with Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration. The last real pivotal scene that we see of Elijah before he goes and finds his replacement is Elijah sitting down the edge of the desert and he says, God, I, I'm no better than my fathers. If you would, please just let me die. It's hard to, to fathom, to conceive that the greatest prophet of the Old Testament just a few days before prayed so fervently that fire rained down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, the prophets of Baal were slaughtered. He stood that day as one against 400. And two days later, he's saying, God... When I look at myself, I'm a loser. If you would, just let me die. Have you ever been proverbially at the end of your rope? You know, where you feel like either physically or emotionally you're hanging over a cliff and you You've got a few fingers left of that rope and you're just holding on. You're trying to decide, am I going to hold on? Can I hold on? Or God, just, just let me go. I'm done. If you've never been there, the truth about it is, most of us at some point in time in our life are going to get there. And when we get there, one of the things you're going to find out is that you feel like, I'm a failure. Sometimes you and I think, well, you know, I did something to cause this. Sometimes we think, well, you know, everybody's against me. But no matter what, you, you, you've lost your sense of hope. So today the title of my sermon is, At the End of Our Rope, God Moves. You know, there's some amazing verses in the Bible about hopelessness and helplessness and the feelings and the emotions behind it. Matter of fact, there's some amazing chapters. One such chapter is Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. David wrote, I will lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he watches over Israel and neither sleeps nor slumbers. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going from now and forevermore. We read that psalm as believers, and yet there are still times that we feel hopelessness. In Isaiah 12, 2, the Bible says, God is my Savior. I will trust Him and not be afraid. The Lord gives me power and strength. He is my Savior. We, we look at that verse and say, I've got strength and I've got power, yet the greatest men of the Old Testament are going, God, I'm done. Just let me die. In Isaiah 41, 10, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. 
Yet there are times in our fear and our troubled heart that we are dismayed. In Isaiah 41, 13, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. It, it is amazing when he talks about weapons that can destroy us, he, he picks up the phrase, and no tongue can accuse you. Romans 8, 18, Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will revealed later. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And we know that we know that we know that. And yet at times we come to the end of our rope. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic for the Lord your God will go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. That flies in the face of Elijah, this great man that says, God, I am all alone. Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus said to the disciples, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. 1 John 5, 4, For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that, that has overcome the world, our faith. John says to believers that, that you can have victory in your faith. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be? Come on. If God can be for us, who can be? Verse 37, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor the future, nor any power, neither height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ our Lord. If God is for us, who can be against us? Yet sometimes, like Elijah and Moses, we're grasping to the, at the end of our rope, going, God, what am I going to do now? So today I want to talk to you about some things that you need to know when, it, you're, when you're at your end, when you're at the end of the rope. Now, I know that some of us today are going to be real spiritual and say, well, you know, I have faith in God. I've never been there. Well... Good for you. You're better than Moses and Elijah and the prophets. You ought to applaud yourself and there you go. So just tone deaf, turn your hearing aid off. You don't need to hear this. But if you're like the rest of us that go through times where you go, God, I, I don't know what to do. Today, this is for you. Some things you need to know when you're at your end. Number one, when I am at my end, God is not. When you get to that spot where you go, God, I am done. God's going, good. Now we can get something done. There was a woman uh, who lived in Israel in Zarephath, and uh, they were in the middle of a drought. They were in a drought because they had sinned against God and, and they, had fallen, they had followed other gods and Elijah, uh, or not, excuse me, not Elijah, but, but, but it was Elijah. Elijah said, you know what? If you're not going to abide by God, then God's going to withhold the rain. Now we know that God said, listen, if you disobey me, I'm going to bring judgment on you. They brought it on themselves, but here's this woman. She's a single mom. She's got a little boy and... Uh, when there's a drought in the land, it affects both the unjust and the innocent. Now, I want to make sure you understand the reason why I've picked this text is because it answers some questions what we do with, at, when we're at the end of the rope. But I'll be quite frank with you. 
it is probably one of the better pictures of America today in the Old Testament. Last night, uh, late, late into the night, I was going over my sermon for the fourth or fifth time, trying to cut it down so it would fit it within the time frame that we have. And uh, I crossed the, the, the news when I stopped just to take a break. I was uh, reading about another police officer that was killed during a routine traffic stop in Chicago last night. We in America are in a season of, of dryness as a nation. Um, what at times we used to celebrate has now at times become divisive. In 1 Kings 17, verse 7, sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land, and then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. The, the phrase I want to make sure you get, I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now I'm going to say it one more time. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now that's God's view of things. God's view is that I've put a widow there and she's going to feed you. It's going to be okay. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He, he called to her and said, Would you bring me a little jar of water so that I may drink? And as she was going to get it, he said, and please bring me a piece of bread. Now, God's perspective is I've directed a widow there to feed you. The woman's perspective is much different. And I'm not talking about men are from Mars, women from Venus perspective. Okay? That the woman was really at the end of a rope. Because in verse 12, she says, as surely as the Lord God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I've only got a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in the drug, and I'm grabbing a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it, and help me out, and die. God says to Elijah, listen, go to the brook. There's a woman there that's going to feed you and everything's going to be okay. And the woman's going to the brook to get some sticks. Basically, she wants to get a little bit of firewood so she can cook what little flour she's gotten to bread so she and her son can have their last meal and die. Her plan for the day was to cook something good and die. Would you say that's at the end of her rope? She's grasping by her fingernail. Matter of fact, I think she's holding on to a knot with her pinky. Can you imagine her prayer that morning, God? Would you give me enough strength that I can feed my son one more meal before he and I die of starvation? Because we're done. There's nothing left in the house. There's nowhere to go to get it. God, I'm done. What I want you to see is when I am at my end, look to see God's plan. You see, often when you and I get to our end and there's nothing we can do, One of my dear friends, I, I just, just love dearly, has this phrase that, that has affected me so very much. I didn't cause it, I can't cure it, I can't change it, but it's close to that. I didn't do any, I, I didn't cause it, I, there, there's, there's nothing that I can do. When we come to the place where we say, you know what, there's nothing I can do. 
we need to understand that God is in the middle of things, taking action, even when we can't see it. There's a story that I was told a long time ago. There's a lot of little boy named Tommy, and he was one of those kids that's always into something and always doing you know, wrong things. He wanted to, to cut a widow lady's yard next to it, and he went down and he, he cut her hydrangea. And uh, I was out of town here a couple of years ago, and somebody decided they were going to help me and take care of my yard. I just planted uh, blackberry bushes across the back fence of my backyard, and I got back, and my yard was cut. I was just so pleased. I was just so tickled. I walked into my black my my backyard to see how my black because as a little kid I used to walk out in the country and find wild blackberry bushes. I love blackberry cobbler. I just I love that stuff. And uh, and uh, my friend was with me. And he said, "You know, and preacher and I even cut up all that scraggly hedges across the back of your fence and cleaned it all up, threw it in the trash for you." You see, often when all you and I can see are weeds, God says, you know what? I got some blackberries that I've planted for you. A little boy named Tommy uh, was just one of those rounders and always into trouble, and his dad said, you know, we've always told him that you know, we're going to get switches and ashes, and he didn't want to bring ashes in the house, so he had a friend that raised horses, and he went and cleaned out a stall, put in a burlap bag, put a bow on it, put it underneath the tree. Little Tommy that morning opened up that bag and he saw the straw and the hay and the horse manure and said, Dad, is this what I got for Christmas? He said, yeah, you've, you've been so bad this year, I thought this is what I'd give you. And he said, oh, Dad, that is great. And Tommy jumped up, started running through the house, went outside, started running all around the outside of the house, ran outside the fence. He finally came inside huffing and puffing and said, Dad, Dad, where is it? He says, son, what do you mean? It's right there. He says, Dad, I'm looking for the horse that goes with it. Now, now that's a, 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 a goofy story that apparently y'all don't think is funny. But the truth about it is, when you and I are looking at our life and we're going, God, all I see is a bag of manure. God is saying, but you know, you don't get a bag of manure without a horse. Notice what's going on in verse 13. Excuse me, verse 12. Excuse me, verse 13. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do as, as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain into the land. God says, you need to understand <coughs> that while you're looking to fix the last meal to die, God is looking to make provision in your life. You and I need to understand that no matter what's going on around us as a child of God, God has a plan for your life. And even though we're sitting down saying, God, just let me die, God is saying, oh, but wow, have I got a plan for you. To be honest with you, I believe that that as she poured the flour and the oil out of those two jars, I don't think the jars ever fully filled. I think every time she poured them out to fix something for God's servant, for her and her son, God would fill the little jar up just a little bit. You see, often God is not going to say, okay, now that you're empty, you're going to win the lottery. God often says, now that you're empty, I'm going to give you enough to sustain you. Elijah looked at that woman and said, I know that you're afraid. But God is going to give you what you need when you need it. In God's cosmic heavenly plan while she's looking for a gracious way to let go of the rope God is planning a way 
to sustain her. When you are at your end, if you'll open your eyes and look, God wants to sustain you. You see, the truth about it is, is that you've got two choices. She could have looked at Elijah and said, forget it, this is all I've got. I'm fixing something for my son, and then we're going to die. She had that option. She had the option to let loose of the rope. But I want to make sure you understand her other option was not to grab the rope tighter. The other option, God wasn't saying, now listen, put your other hand up here and you hold up. Her other option was, God, I can't hold on anymore. I need you to hold on to me. So that's what you did. She did. When at your end, sometimes the only thing you can do is walk in faith. She went away and did as Elijah had told her, verse 15, so there was food every day for Elijah, for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word the Lord spoke by Elijah. God basically said, I know you're tired. I know you're at the end. If you will, will you let me hold on to you? And God did. Here's the problem. We can end the story there and go, man, praise the God, pass the potatoes. It is, ain't life good. Excuse my Mississippi grammar. Sometime when I'm tired, I revert. Isn't God good? It wouldn't it be wonderful if we just stopped the story there? Wouldn't it be great if I just stand in front of you and say, you know what, when you, God will hold your hand, you're going to be okay. Just trust him. Everything's all right. Amen. Let's pray. Let's go home. Because God got it. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. You see, you and I have got this idea that, that you know, if I just trust God, then everything's going to be okay and then everything's going to be great. If I can get a needle and pop your balloon for you real quick, when I do, don't cry. I want to make sure you understand that sometimes while God's holding on to you and he's, he's holding you by the hand, you got a good grip and you're saying, okay, God, God, it's you and me. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. When you can't defend yourself, Satan comes up and sucker punches you. Verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally he stopped breathing. I mean, I mean, here's a woman who's by faith feeding God's prophet every day. When you feed the preacher every day, bad things aren't supposed to happen, amen? I, I want to make sure you understand it wasn't Elijah's fault, so if you want to feed me, that doesn't mean something's going to happen. It's kind of underhanded. I can't get y'all to laugh at anything today. I guess it needs to stop crying to get you to laugh. She looked at Elijah and she said, what do you have against me, man of God? Did, did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from his arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on his bed, and then he cried out to the Lord, Lord God, have you brought tragedy even in this window that I'm staying with by causing your son to die? You see, 
The widow was in the drought. Elijah was in the drought with her. He stretched himself out on the boy three times and he cried to the Lord, Lord my God, let the boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. And Elijah picked up the child and carried him down to the room and to the house and he, he gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. The woman said to Elijah, now I know that you're a man of God and the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. When it went bad, who did she attack? She didn't attack God, she attacked Elijah. You see, when all is lost, you and I need to seek God's restoration. It is never the end until it's the end. You see, God has you and I here for a purpose, and often, sometimes, you and I lose things, and we we give up things, sometimes we hurt, sometimes life is just hard, and the only thing you and I can do is say, okay, God, here's my life, do with it as you choose. And you know what? It's going to be okay. Why? Hold on one second. I need to read the slide from the music. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. You see, there is nothing that you and I will ever go through. Sickness, disease, finances, national tragedy, national de debate, you name it. There's nothing that you're going to face that God is not fighting your battles and sometimes when you think you've lost, God comes in and ultimately God restores. We, we just sang multiple times, who can stop the Lord Almighty? When all is lost, seek God's restoration. But you see, the truth about it is, is, that, is that there are times that I've lost and it wasn't because Satan attacked me. It wasn't because God wanted to get me to grow. There are times in my life I've lost because I've done something. Can, can I say the word? Can I have done something dumb? And I look at what's happening and go, you know what? I did this to me. So when all is lost, and it's my fault, guess what? See God's restoration. The Song of Songs, Solomon said this in chapter 2, verse 15, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Solomon warns people in love, listen, catch the foxes. Because they're going to tear up your garden. You say, well, you know, if I've done this to myself, then, then, then I deserve it. You know what? You do. That doesn't mean in the midst of it, God doesn't want to redeem you. In Judges chapter 16 is the story of, of the strongest man in the world. If there was a strong man competition in 750 B.C., Samson would have won hands down. As a little kid, we used to watch Saturday morning wrestling, and, and I'll never forget watching Ivan Putsky and Joe LaDuke. A little boy, we went to Lake Village High School Auditorium and I watched Ivan Putsky, a five foot eight Polish strong man, whoop Fritz von Erich in the Iron Claw. Fritz von Erich took his hand and I mean, he, 
he had him clawed on the chest and Ivan Putsky grabbed one hand and he, and he, and he pulled his hand up. Ivan Putsky, huge guy. He put the offensive line of Arkansas State on top of a table and they all sat on this table and Ivan Putsky sat down underneath it and got underneath it and picked it up with his back. I was so impressed. I wanted to be Ivan Putsky. Samson was the Ivan Putsky of his day. The only problem is that Samson lost it all and it was his fault. We find Samson in Judges 16 having been blinded and turned basically into a circus freak. In Judges 16, 25, while they were in high spirits, the Philistines, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison and he performed for them. Samson, the man that the world feared, now had his hair shorn, his eyes gouged out. The man that the Philistines would run from as an army. At one day he took the jawbone of a donkey and killed a hundred men. Now instead of being feared, he was the joke. And why was he a joke? Because he blew it. He got involved with a woman that wasn't a faith. And even though he knew that he knew that he knew, she would say, Samson, what's the source of your strength? And she would go tell the Philistines and then the Philistines would come and try to do exactly what he had told her. He knew that she was a lying, cheating, no good harlot. He knew. And yet one day Samson looked at her and said, you know, if you cut off my hair, I'll lose my strength. So while he's asleep, she does the exact thing that he tells her. Samson gave up his ability to be a judge for God for a harlot. Remember I told you the key is when all is lost, seek God's restoration. It applies to all of us. Verse 28, then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more and let with one blow get revenge on the Philistines from my eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against him, his right hand on one, his left on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all of his might. Down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. What was Samson's purpose in life? To protect Israel from the Philistines at his death. He took out the king of Philistia, their generals, their captains. In that one moment, he killed more than in all the other years combined. He fulfilled his purpose in life. You see, the truth about it is, you and I need to understand when you and I are at the end of our rope, you need to understand that God has put everything in motion so at that end, at that moment, 
God's work in my life and yours can be fulfilled. You see, when you're at your end, celebrate the fact that before you ever got there, God was just waiting for you to show up. So whether you're in this room this morning and you're at your end, God is waiting for you. You that are watching on Facebook today or will be watching on YouTube later on during the week, whether you're at your end, God's been waiting for you to get there. Your responsibility is to open your eyes and see what God has in store. You don't have to keep hanging on. He will hang on to you. Please stand let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your love and your grace. Father, thank you for an amazing day. You sent your son to give his life on the cross so that whosoever would believe in you would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, there are those in this room today and life has been very difficult and has, and, has, and has given them blows. And some of them are like Moses or Elijah or the woman, the widow at Zarephath or like Samson. Some of us, life's brought it on. Some of us, just, just life is hard. Some of it, Lord, is self-inflicted wounds. I have done this to myself. Father, I thank you according to the authority of your word that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. The promise of your sovereignty our life is, in our life is not conditional on our obedience or on our acceptance or on the parameters the world has placed. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you is based on the promise of the love of God that is undeniable, immutable, unchangeable, unstoppable. So Father, for those that are within the sound of my voice that are at the end of the rope, Father, I pray that you would open their eyes to see that you're God. And you're not going to start working, but help them see that you have been working. Before any of this even started, God, you had a plan. Father, I pray that you would give each person that's struggling today a glimpse of that plan. For you are God that gives hope to the hopeless and help to the helpless. Father, I pray that we would be like that little boy in that apocryphal story. I see the hay straw and the manure in life, God. Lord, today, help me start looking for the pony. In Jesus' name we pray. Please worship with us.